Okay, so um, hello everybody, and uh, we're happy to have uh, our first, I think, student seminar of the year. Olivier, so Olivier will talk about. Uh, oh, there we go. Olivier will talk about work with um, some of us here about black hole super radiance of self-interacting scalar fields. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for. Uh, everyone for being here. So as was just said, I'll be telling you about uh, black hole super radiance of self-interacting scalar fields. Uh, this is work that has been, uh, this is based on work that's been posted to the archive a few months ago uh, in collaboration with Masha Baryaktar, Marius Galanis, and Robert Lazenby. Uh, oops, okay. So <clears throat> as many people on this call um, know, uh, black holes are potentially very, uh, very powerful probes into uh, new scalar particles beyond the standard model. And that is because rotating black holes are expected to source clouds of ultralight scalars through a process known as super radiance. Um, and the only thing that is necessary for that to happen is that the new scalar be included in the Lagrangian of the universe. Uh, in particular, this process is expected to be largely independent of cosmological uh, abundance. Um, and so it, uh, it doesn't require your new scalar to be dark matter, although, although it can be. Um, so far, it's been uh, fairly well established in the literature that uh, weakly interacting scalars will spin down black holes and source gravitational waves. Uh, and this work is in particular gonna be interested in the uh, expected self-interactions of those scalars. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll, I'll be able to convince you that uh, more strongly interacting scalars uh, still undergo the super radiance phenomenon uh, uh, but now the, the, the new signature uh, is the emission of scalar waves. So um, I'll be starting with a review of super radiance, black hole super radiance, then I'll move on specifically to uh, um, how self-interactions modify the dynamics of the cloud, and finally I'll talk about the signatures at large self-interactions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, black hole, uh, super radiance in general is, uh, is, uh, is, an, is a very fun, interesting topic that um, as applications in many physical systems. It's not uh, limited to black hole systems. Uh, so there are many segues into this and I, and I like this mechanical um, uh, introduction. So if you imagine an object scattering off a, station, a stationary cylinder that's allowed to spin on its axis, um, it, this, the object will lose energy and angular momentum to the cylinder if there is friction at the surface or if there is dissipation. So the object comes in, transfers some of its motion to the rotational motion of the cylinder. Uh, however, if the cylinder starts with uh, uh, some large angular velocity, then the opposite will happen. And an object scattering of a rotating cylinder will, will extract energy and angular momentum from the cylinder if, um, uh, again, there is damping and if a certain kinematic condition is satisfied, namely that the angular velocity of cylinder be uh, bigger, larger than the, the initial angular velocity of the object being scattered. So, um, you know, this is, this is perhaps not too surprising. This is rather intuitive, but, but in a way it is a little bit surprising because at least I tend to think of friction as something that, that dissipates motions, that, that, that damps the motion of objects. And so it's, it's super radiance is the phenomenon of this dissipative mechanism actually leading to the enhancement of, of motion or of energy. There is a wave analog to this phenomenon uh, that was worked out by Zolovich in the 70s. Uh, so an ins uh, a wave that, it in that is incident on a rotating dissipative surface will grow in amplitude by extracting energy and angular momentum if uh, the so-called uh, super radiance kinematic condition is satisfied. This condition being now that the angular velocity of the rotator, of the absorber, be larger than the angular phase uh, wave velocity. So the ratio of the wave's frequency over its angular momentum number, if we do a spherical harmonic decomposition. Uh, and the dissipation can occur either via uh, absorbing boundary conditions or some first uh, derivatives in the equation of motions. Um, so the wave packet comes in uh, and some of the energy and angular momentum goes and the, uh, gets transferred and the wave uh, rather than spinning up will now grow in amplitude. Um, so that's in a classical theory, but of course in a quantum field theory, uh, a growth in amplitude means that there's now more, more quanta, more particles in the wave. So there's particle creation that occurs. 
Uh, and again, dissipation is necessary. The growth is proportional to the probability of absorption when the, objects, uh, when the object is addressed. Uh, now, it turns out that the universe uh, provides us naturally with rapidly rotating perfect absorbers in the form of rotating black holes. And so, it, it, and so indeed, uh, rotational superradiance occurs for uh, Kerr, Kerr, Kerr black holes. Uh, goes under the name of black hole superradiance. And now the condition is that the angular velocity of the black hole uh, be larger than uh, the, the angular wave velocity. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this was uh, for essentially a massless field, something that obeys a, a free uh, massless wave, uh, wave equation. Uh, however, if uh, there is a massive term in the equation of motion, we might, at least at the level of sort of cartoon, we might expect that uh, if nothing else, the Newtonian potential of the black hole will confine the motion of the wave packet to massive bound states around the black hole. And that this will lead to some repeated amplification as the wave sort of bounces around in, in this confined potential and um, uh, grows a little bit in amplitude every time it interacts with the black hole. So we might suspect that there's gonna be some uh, instability in the spectrum that some states, some of those bound states are going to be unstable to growth. And indeed uh, that is the case. And the growth is largest when the Compton wavelength of the particle is comparable to the black hole uh, radius. So for a solar mass uh, object, which has a, a, a black or Schwarzschild radius of about three kilometers, uh, this corresponds to uh, the ultralight mass range of about uh, between 10 to the minus uh, 10 EV to um, about 10 to the minus 13 EV. Uh, Alvia, yeah. can, I, can I ask, is there a similar uh, effect for fermions? No, so fermions uh, essentially cannot do that because of Fermi, what boils down to Fermi Dirac statistics. Right. So we'll, yeah, we'll see, uh, we'll talk about just now the occupation number that builds in the cloud. It's extremely large. Um, and, and for fermions, it's, it's capped to one. Okay, thank you. Just to say one thing, that hasn't stopped people writing papers on it. There's a Strominger paper about fermions around black, rotating black holes, which finds that, yes, occupation number equals one. So yeah. you can. Okay. So, um, Olivier, can I also ask a quick question? Yes. Right, and maybe you can defer this to later if you're going to mention it. Uh, so, since you're going to be talking about interactions, Mm -hmm. There's the zeroth order interaction that I might imagine would significantly affect this, which is a non-minimal coupling to gravity. Uh, yeah. So the Ricci scalar near black holes is, can be quite large. Uh, have people thought about this? Does this affect in any significant way? Actually, the answer is I'm not sure. I thought the same thought occurred to me yesterday as I was uh, writing the slides and stuff. Um, Maybe, I don't know if someone in the, the audience knows. I personally- Sorry, the Ricci scalar in the external region for the black hole is zero. Oh, because sorry, yes. Uh, Riemann uh, tension is correct. non-zero, Ricci. You're correct. Yeah. you're correct, you're correct, okay. That's true. Um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, no, yeah exactly. Um, Can I also ask? Yes. Uh, so the reason why we do not discuss neutron stars instead of black hole rotating neutron is the stars is it because uh, we don't want to talk about the interactions of axions with, with the standard model uh well even if so so you need you, the reason is you need absorption and, and black holes are are very good absorbers because they're 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 you know the the absorption is is independent. You know, it only needs it's universal, and you only need an event horizon. Uh, for neutron stars, you can have basically you need you actually do need to have significant interactions between the neutron star and the axion to provide or any other scalar field to provide this dissipative mechanism. And uh -huh. generically, those interactions are going to be too small to provide um, uh, large enough rates so that they're phenomenologically interesting. Okay. Thanks. So, um, so what, once, what, what one wants to do is solve for a scalar wave equation in the background geometry of a rotating black hole. Um, so you're going to look out for massive bound states. Uh, far enough away from the black hole, the potential, as I said, looks Newtonian. 
um, which is in one-to-one -one analogy with a Coulombian potential where the role of the fine structure constant is now being played by the product GMM, um, the ratio or the ratio of the Compton wavelength to the, to the Schwarzschild radius. Um, so we've already solved that problem because that's just the hydrogen atom. Um, for astrophysical black holes, we're going to be talking about alphas of order uh, 10 minus 2 to about 1. Uh, the size of the cloud is, again, uh, given to you by this solution to, to the Schrodinger problem of the hydrogen atom. It's going to be the Bohr radius. So uh, since alpha is generally small, uh, the cloud is bigger by a few order of magnitudes uh, than the black hole horizon. And then the spectrum, uh, uh, the one energy, the one particle energies have um, uh, real parts uh, made up of the rest mass and the, um, the, the small hydrogenic binding energies. And then crucially, a uh, small imaginary part that is the super radiant rate, uh, which shows that the state are unstable to grow. So uh, now you might say, well, in the in the, the the intuition you brought up before, I've said, well, I need to send in some 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 wave that get that then gets amplified. So does that mean I need to have a pre-existing occupation in those bound states for the cloud to grow? And the answer is no. Uh, you can work from zero point quantum fluctuations. It's the same way as if you have as a laser. Uh, if you have a a large population of excited atoms. All you need is for a first one to undergo spontaneous emission. And then the stimulated emission is going to do the rest of the job for you. Um, the occupation number that was mentioning is very large. Uh, each particle being created carries one H bar or order one H bar of angular momentum. Uh, so you expect a number of particle that is set by the angular momentum, uh, the original angular momentum of the black hole, which for a, massive, a solar mass black hole is about 10 to the 76. Um, so that is an interesting probe because the prediction is that if new light scalars, well, one of the predictions is that if new light scalars exist, uh, fast spinning black holes will spin down as energy and angular momentum is converted to a scalar cloud. Uh, so the basic equation of evolutions are those two equations, the cloud grows, the black hole spin decreases. Uh, so, for example, in the uh, plane of mass versus spin, uh, you can imagine a black hole that is born um, with uh, a fairly uh, a 0.9. So the A star is the dimensionless spin that goes from 0 to 1 for 0 for Schwarzschild, 1 for extremal. So a, a fast black hole is born with uh, about 0.9 A star. Uh, in about a year or so, if there's an axion that exists of uh, the right mass, the black hole will spin down until it no longer satisfied the uh, until the its angular momentum uh, its yeah, its its uh, rotational velocity is uh, too small to satisfy the uh, super radiance condition for that particular hydrogenic number. Uh, but if you wait uh, longer, uh, the super radiance to higher uh, angular momentum numbers can still occur. There's a, li a large hierarchy of time scales between them, and so about ten to the six years. Uh, you will saturate the super radiance condition for L equals two. And then um, that will go on until the, the angular momentum is depleted to the point where uh, the super radiance condition is not satisfied for any levels. So uh, as things evolve over time, we'll be looking at a lot of, of these plots. Uh, the top plots show the occupation in the two most super radiant level, the most super radiance being two, two, one, one. Sorry, I missed something in the previous slide. What were the L equals one, two, three? I guess you explained it as. Yes. So I, power, huh? Yeah, I skipped that. Uh, I should have been more explicit. Those are your, because the spectrum is like the hydrogen atom, those right. are basically the quantum, uh, the quantum numbers. Um, and, and the super radiance rates are always the largest for your uh, L equals M levels. And so you can independent, equivalently say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, These are the levels which the scalar occupies. Yes, the hydrogenic levels. Okay. But there is a statement being being made that only specific Ls are in the next slide. That given an A star and an M, only specific Ls are allowed. Right. So, um, right. So the reason there's this turnover here is because as you go to larger Ls. Um, you can you can satisfy the uh, uh, super radiant condition for a, a, a bigger range of mass. However, the rates themselves are heavily suppressed with L. So that's that turnover that happens. For example, like in principle, that curve for L equals three 
the mm. super radiant condition uh, extends all the way to here. But because, of course, black holes have, have finite lives, they have, uh, you know, they have a certain age, uh, then there's this turnover that happens that says basically there is in principle super radiance, but it's just too slow to be, to be seen in the, in the lifetime of the black hole. I see. Thank you. Um, so the top plot shows out the occupation of the two most super radiant uh, levels um, uh, evolves with time. We like to work in terms of those X epsilons, which are the occupation numbers uh, normalized to um, the expected uh, occupation of the cloud. So an epsilon of one is what we would call a full cloud. Uh, a star is the dimensionless spin of the black hole. And for this choice of parameter in about 10 years or so, uh, the 211 level uh, gets occupied uh, and correspondingly there's a, is a, a drop in the angular momentum of the black hole. And then as you wait, as you wait for longer, the 211 level sort of sticks around but is slowly being depleted by annihilations to gravitational waves. So two to one annihilations of scalars to gravitational waves. And that will occur. So mean, while the annihilations are, are occurring, the much slower super radiance to three to two is still uh, happening just much more slowly. Eventually though, it sort of manages to catch up, three to two grows, that's the dashed line. Uh, and essentially when that happened, the spin drops again, making those two one one levels now unstable. They start being absorbed back into the black hole. And as a result, the two levels essentially switch place. And now there's a three to two cloud, which can go, can go on and annihilate the gravitational waves. Uh, so the important takeaway is that in the case of purely gravitational superradiance, the evolution is characterized by those cycles of growth via superradiance and uh, periods of depletion via annihilations to gravitational waves. Uh, and uh, only one level at a time effectively is uh, occupied. So uh, that's the first, uh, that's a quick review of superradiance. Uh, are there any questions in that first part that I haven't addressed? If not, then uh, we'll move on to self-interaction in the cloud. So the, the, the short segue is that uh, most well-motivated scalar extensions to the standard model are expected to have uh, quartic self-interactions. Uh, case in point, of course, the uh, QCD axion, for example, which is perhaps the uh, best motivated scalar extension to the standard model as a solution to strong CP problem, has a potential which at low energy at least uh, looks like a cosine, if you expand this cosine, first you get the quadratic term, which is your mass term, which uh, because the prefactor in the specific case of the QCD axion, the prefactors here are uh, specified by uh, strong physics, um, pion constants and, and such. So the mass is fully determined by the symmetry breaking scale that appears in the, Lagrange in the potential. And so to get an ultralight scalar to which super radiance of extraphysical black hole would be sensitive to, you need an FA that's a little bit above the gut scale. Uh, you expand the next order, you get a, a quartic self-interaction uh, that parameter param with, with uh, coupling lambda that parametrically goes as mu over uh, mu squared over FA squared. Again, because the, the, the QCD axion has a fixed relationship between mu and F, the coupling is entirely specified by the mass. And so for an ultralight scalar, you get a lambda of about 10 to the minus 80. So that's for the QCD axion, but generically uh, we expect uh, ultralight scalars to appear as low energy remnants of high energy physics, for example, as Kaluza Klein modes uh, from compactification and string theory. Uh, that's the so-called axiverse on which uh, some of the people on this call have been working on. Um, so, and those two are expected to have quartic self-interactions that parametrically go as their masses over F squared for some symmetry breaking scale squared. Um, although unlike the QCD axion, the relationship between mu and F is not fixed and can vary independently. So for an F around the gut scale and an ultralight uh, scalar, you get a lambda of about 10 to minus 74, uh, which is, so 10 to 70 minus 74, 10 to minus 80, those are, those are tiny couplings, but we'll see that essentially because of the large occupate, the very large occupation numbers in the cloud, uh, even such tiny cou couplings can have significant effects on the evolution. So you don't care about the sign of lambda? Uh, 
So largely, no, you may care for uh, uh, whether if you're worried about a collapse, you may worry about uh, um, uh, attractive versus repulsive, uh, but largely lambda enters as lambda squared um, in many of the rates we're gonna be talking about. And so in terms of how it affects the evolution of the cloud, uh, as long as it remains perturbative, uh, it, it, it makes no difference. Okay. Uh, so if we um, if we uh, put things in the open, if we plot the open uh, axion parameter space, um, the astrophysical uh, black hole super radiance is sensitive to the lower range of that uh, of that mass range. Um, self interactions grow as one over f, so a smaller f means larger self interactions. Uh, and we see that basically there are very few constraints. Uh, the constraints come from the famous supernova 1987. And the coupling, the, the F, F is unconstrained for a fairly large um, portion of parameter space. Although uh, we're only fairly, con we're in the preceding literature, uh, you could only be really con confident about your, your super, uh, super radiant story when F was rather large and you were confident that the self interactions were gonna be small. And so the question remained open exactly how far you can extend that range into uh, larger self interactions. And that's what we are going to address. So, okay, assuming you have um, self interactions uh, in a super radiant, radiant cloud, what are the kind of particle physics processes that can happen? Uh, you can have self energy correction terms that are essentially uh, levels interacting with themselves and their manifestations or whether the of whether the cloud wants to attract itself or repel itself. And uh, this could lead to, this is what, this is one way to assess um, phenomenon, like if there's a collapse due to large attractive self interactions. Um, what had been perhaps underappreciated before was uh, the interaction between bound states, between different bound states, for example, interactions between 211, 322, uh, so sup interactions between super radiant states, but most importantly, they can now interact with st states that are being damped by the black hole that are not super radiant. For example, all the M equals zero states uh, do not satisfy the super radiant condition, so they're being damped. And that's gonna end up playing a very important role in uh, the growth of the cloud. There's also interactions between uh, the bound states and the continuum, uh, non-relativistic emissions. If you have occupations in say 322, you can have one particle drop to 211 and then the difference in energy uh, is transferred to the other partner, which is now sufficient. Uh, the, the difference in energy is sufficiently large for the other partner to escape to infinity um, with an energy of the order of the, uh, uh, well, the kinetic energy, a, a small correction to the mass. So this is non-relativistic emissions. Uh, in principle, there's also a possibility for relativistic emissions where you get conversions of say three particles into a, a, a very relativistic uh, product particle, although in practice this is extremely suppressed in large in, with large powers of alpha, uh, and morally this is because the cloud is a largely non-relativistic object, and it's just hard to obtain relativistic uh, radiation from non-relativistic objects. Um, and so, given those processes, the question is: At what value of lambda do self interactions become important, and what are the new effects? So uh, as it's been pointed out in, by Gruzinov in, in, in the context of a toy model, that a, a particular set of three processes could give you interesting dynamics. And those processes are, of course, super radiance. And then this level pumping process, which involves uh, interactions between bound states and with the black hole. And the black hole sort of plays a critical role here, the fact that there is damping, because that will lead to, that leads to a transfer from 211 particles to 322 particles uh, that is larger than you would expect it, that than you would expect if, if the black hole were not pre present. And then there are, uh, as I said, the process of non-relativistic uh, scalar emissions from higher level to lower level. Um, and so the scenario that we envision is that the black hole will get populated, uh, uh, sorry, the cloud will get populated by the black hole through super radiance, 211 being the most super radiant level. Uh, a second level can now get populated through self interactions via this uh, pumping process. And then finally, non relativistic scalar waves can carry energy and angular momentum to infinity. And the reason those three processes taken together are particularly interesting 
um, is because they can lead to a quasi-equilibrium system between uh, two levels, uh, where the cloud stops growing and uh, you, get, you enter a different regime where momentum is being circulated directly from the black hole to infinity. So we'll see many plots like this, but the cartoon picture is that um, the, the, the original growth proceeds as it would otherwise via superradiance, but then when 211 has enough occupation, the nonlinear pumping process becomes important. 322 grows, and now that 322 has been occupied, um, um, radiation to infinity uh, can, uh, of scalar waves can occur. And so there's a quasi equilibrium system where the, the, the size of the cloud is fixed and momentum goes from the black hole to the cloud and from the cloud to infinity. Sorry, may I ask you a question? Levels like three to one, uh, they do not matter for this story or? Yes, yeah, so the three to ones do not matter for the story. They're, they're largely suppressed uh, when alpha, as I said, alpha is a small number uh, and that's because the cloud is a non-relativistic wave function basically. So if you wanna, you know, if you do the Fourier transform and try to project out the the, the relativistic portions of that wave function, uh, th this overlap is just very small. Uh, and non -relativ it's hard for a non-relativist op relativistic object to do a, a relativistic process. Okay. So uh, what we've done uh, is do, so that was in the context of a toy model. What we've done is do uh, a more realistic analysis. Uh, among other things, the, to the toy model ignored the fact that well, the, the, the black hole geometry changes as, as, as angular momentum is being extracted. And so we were able to identify um, four qualitatively different regions um, that you go through as you take the self-interactions to be larger and larger. So when self-interactions are small and F is large, uh, you have the usual story of gravitational superradiance where you have your usual spin down and then relations to gravitational waves. As you take the interactions to be larger, you enter this regime of moderate self-couplings where you start seeing an early growth of C22, but you still get your spin down and your gravitational annihilations. If you go a little bit higher, you enter the large self-interactions regime where now the levels can grow simultaneously. Um, your gravitational waves are starting to be severely affected and are rather replaced by scalar waves. And, but given enough time, you will still spin down and then eventually you get so large um, uh, an interaction that you have no spin down, but now scalar waves are your primary signatures. Uh, and for, so, the, so that again, that was for a two level model uh, and the two level system is a good approximation until alpha of, a, of about 0.2. Uh, if you go to alpha of, uh, uh, beyond, uh, above 0.2, um, you can show that uh, more levels are likely to grow. Basically, you go to 1, 1 and 3, 2, 2, but then interactions between 2, 1, 1 and 3, 2, 2 uh, can source further levels uh, with, for, with higher angular momentum. And so you need to include more levels in your analysis and that becomes a more complicated story. Uh, Olivier, when you say no spin down, what does this mean? This means no spin down for this mass black hole in the age of the universe? Yeah, precisely. So I'll go in detail through time evolutions, showing plots of time evolutions for each of those regimes. So if you have a black hole in this region, well, in this region of mass and coupling, if you have an axion, I should say, in this region of mass and coupling, um, this is the usual story that I've already shown you. You get growth, annihilations, the two levels switch place. Now, as you move on to this region, the first part of the evolution goes on like uh, largely undisturbed. The 211 superradiance occurs undisturbed. There's extraction of angular momentum to the cloud. Uh, and then the main new feature is that now 322 grows much earlier than it otherwise would via superradiance. So that was where it used to grow. It grows, you know, many orders of magnitude uh, earlier and establishes a quasi equilibrium, a short period of quasi equilibrium where uh, scalar emissions are possible. Uh, another interesting signature, uh, well, the feature, let's say, uh, is that actually you can uh, saturate the L equals two inequality, superradiance inequality earlier than you would have via superradiance alone. And that's because the superradiance rate of 322 is now operating from a pre existing occupation built up by self interactions, as opposed to having to grow the fluctuations from, from zero point quantum fluctuations. 
So in those two bottom uh, parts of parameter space, the picture is you have a big cloud, the role of which is to store the angular momentum of the black hole. Can, can I ask a really simple question about this plot, which is why does the th three, two, two line, so it, it spikes up, I get this, it grows suddenly because there's some dumping uh, from the two, one, one into the three, two, two. Mm -hmm. Why does the three, two, two drop for a while? before it spikes up? Is this because the Sorry, black what, hole- which, which drop, the 322 is the dashed line, so it spikes yes. up? Yes, and then oh, it goes so, down okay. for a so long time. During, yeah, so during this period, what happens is there's no spin coming from the black hole, essentially because the 211, there's no, ping, no spin going to 211 because the condition's saturated. There is in principle spin going to 322, but it's extremely slow. And meanwhile, you have scalar emissions that are much faster. And so it drops because essentially you're gonna have, there, there's no, there, there's nothing put it, essentially super radiance to 322 hasn't turned on yet, quote unquote. And so there's nothing putting particles into the, into the joint cloud. So both levels decay. But, but sorry, what does that mean? Cause the, the super radiance condition for the 322 mode is still satisfied during this time. It's but just that it's more rate, satisfied for the 211. So. No, it is the, the actual value of the rate is much slower compared to, uh, like you can just the the once you have this occupation built up, the cloud gets depleted via self and via, via scalar emissions much faster. Like saying that the super radiance condition is satisfied just means the rate is positive. The rate of super uh -huh. radiance is positive. It can still be a positive but small number. I, I understand. I'm just trying to understand what happens when it suddenly starts spiking up. So at the end of it. Like if it just kept on going down forever, I would have no problem understanding this. But right. then so at some time at 10 to the six years, suddenly it says, oh, now I've turned on. What happens at that time? Yeah, is so what uh, the cloud, so, so, so yeah, so this, this part of, so as you as the cloud is, as super radiance is trying to populate 322, essentially it can, it has a hard time doing it because 211 is around. And as long as you have 211 around, if you try to put in 322 particles, those are going to be scattered off to infinity, essentially. And so before super radiance can effectively ask, act, actually you need the cloud to decrease a significant amount so that enough 211 particles go away, that 322 is gonna start being competitive against scalar self and against scalar emissions. Okay, so, so what happens at that point is uh, whatever the Bose, so the 322 going to 211 plus infinity is Bose enhanced, right? This is why the, the rate is so large. And you're saying that at this time, the, uh, occupation number of the 211 mode is low enough that that Bose right. enhancement is not is no right. longer large enough to overcome right. super rate. Okay. Point, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I understand. Thank you. Uh, now you move into this region C where things start being qualitatively quite different. Uh, now the super uh, the self interactions are large enough that the two levels grow almost simultaneously. 211 grows first but then rapidly gets cannibalized by 322. Uh, the cloud does not reach its maximum size. And there is still spin down, although it proceeds, you know, previously it kind of dropped like a rock. Now it drops over a much longer period of time. But if the black hole is, um, you know, old enough, uh, allowed enough time to, to age, then black, the, the, the saturation can still, can still happen and the spin extraction can complete. Uh, and meanwhile, there's a quasi-equilibrium between the two levels accompanied by scalar emissions. And then finally, that's what I meant when I said no spin down. If you go to very large self-interactions, uh, the cloud grows well below its maximum size. Although, you know, that's 10 to the, that's epsilon of 10 to the minus 10, but that, that, that's still 10 to, 10 to the 66 particles. So that's still quite a, quite, quite a large number of particles. Uh, but yeah, the spin down will, will be now prolonged for so long that it's essentially longer than astrophysical lifetimes. Uh, this is, I think we plotted it for the age of the universe and you can see that the, the, the spin down barely completes, you know, in the entire age of the universe. So essentially no, no spin down can occur. Uh, Olivier, and, Olivier yes. can I ask you something? At yeah. what point, I don't know if you guys have done this estimate, at what point does, if you assume it is dark matter, when does the density become the same as the dark matter density? Um, we haven't done the estimate. So, uh, you mean at what value of F does the, as the cloud? Yeah, if you were assume it was dark matter, because 
I know where this is going. Because talk. It's going to go to the point where you're going to say, well, we always have some scalar emission and you can always see it in a, in a, in a, in a laboratory setting because oh. the, the, well, I'll, the I'll, have an, I'll, I'll, I'll list later the value of the axion density at Earth and you can compare it to the, the local uh, DM, uh, DM density, for example. Okay. So that's one, that's one comparison you can make. And then you can also ask what it is yeah. in the cloud, um, although we haven't done this, this comparison. But, uh, I mean, but I think, you can detect so say, things. We did, we, at, so you can detect things at far lower densities at Earth because it's a monochromatic signal. Yes, that's the point. Uh, it, it is true. I'm just. I, it just sounds weird when you have something that's so dilute relative to everything else around it, right? So that that's the only thing that that is a bit confusing. I mean, because you. I mean, we, and I'm jumping ahead now, uh, Robert. Yeah. So we, we yeah we we have we have done the numbers on this in, in these in all of this region. It's still way way above dark matter density. Okay. So not not at Earth. Like the signal. This, the scalar radi radiation density at Earth is below the dark matter one. No, no, of course. I'm not black... talking about yeah. that. I'm talking about the, the size yeah. of the cloud around the black hole. I mean, yeah, around, around the black hole, we can start, so you can estimate it roughly, right? So black hole thing is the density, if it was full cloud, would be, mol would be like some number times MeV to the four or something, like mm -hmm. greater than that, because like, it's, it's at least neutron starish density. So it's something along those lines uh and this is 10 to the minus 10 of it so we're still uh mm -hmm. we're still very high mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh yeah i don't have the number right off the top of my head but yeah we're, we're still above dark matter near the thing itself okay okay thanks yeah, i don't yeah even at the, at the smallest smallest f you can go um yeah Awesome. Okay, then the other question I'll ask when you talk about experiments. <laughs> okay. um, so the last thing I want to address in this section is this question of collapse due to attractive self-interactions. So uh, in the previous literature, there were some, some, some claims made about uh, a process known as Bose Nova happening. And the, the Bose Nova is essentially, uh, so uh, recall that um, uh, if you have purely gravitational self uh, superradians, the number of particles in, in the cloud is entirely determined by the black hole mass. And so, as you as you uh, if you fix this number of particles and you take the interactions to be larger and larger, eventually you can get to a point, and this interaction is is attractive. You can imagine getting to a point where uh, attractive self interaction plus get plus gravity overcomes the energy of orbital motion, and then the cloud collapses. And that's uh, what in the, in the literature is, is termed uh, Bose Nova by analogy to some quantum uh, condensed matter systems. Uh, the formal way to, uh, the, the way to formalize the situation is to use a variational method where you, you, you say the cloud is still hydrogenic, but you allow the Bohr radius to vary and you write a potential for the Bohr radius. Um, and uh, so the, the potential is made up of the first two terms are your, your kinetic terms and, and, and gravity. Uh, and essentially, if you just have those two terms and you solve for the, the stable minimum of this potential, you recover the Bohr radius, R equals N squared over alpha squared mu. Uh, the third term is your self-interactions. And you can see that at fixed N, if F is small enough, you expect this last term to overcome the first two and to erase uh, the, the, essentially make it so that the, the potential no longer has a stable minimum. And now you expect that there will be a collapse. Uh, the important point is when you do this uh, and, you, and you solve for the critical number of particles that you need to get a collapse, this number scales as F squared. It makes sense, the smaller F is, the more, the larger self-interactions you get. And so the smaller, the critical number of particles to get a collapse, uh, the smaller the smaller the necessary number of particles to, to get a collapse is, is uh, gets um, but as i just said in the previous uh the previous few slides uh the cloud itself also gets smaller when you go above this green contour and it also gets smaller as f squared 
And so the thing you want to do is, well, do I get a Bose Nova before I reach this point? Because if I don't, now the two numbers are scaling together and uh, I'll never get a collapse. And so indeed that's what we did. So this is a plot of the occupation you get um, from starting from zero point fluctuation relative to the uh, number of particles you would get, uh, you would need to get uh, a Bose Nova collapse. You see that below our critical contour, um, it indeed goes up as one goes up as one over F. However, above the contours become almost vertical uh, because again, both both the numerator and the denominator scales would have scaled the same way with F. And so uh, you get quite far. Well, you get you get quite far from from you never get to uh, order one critical density. Uh, although, so here you get you get you know halfway there, which might be worrisome. Uh, so this plot is for a a two level system, which, as I said, you should really only trust to alpha of about 0.2. Above alpha of 0.2, what happens is you populate more levels, uh, as I said, with larger angular momentum. Uh, those levels of hard, because they have larger angular momentum, they, they're further away from the cloud. They're just overall more spread out. And so by populating more levels, you actually dilute the cloud further. And so for those reasons um, taken together, this plot and, and, and the multi-level dynamics, uh, we expect essentially that uh, Bose Nova, we don't expect a collapse to happen uh, in astrophysical, with astrophysical parameters. Can you repeat again, what's the crossing point where, where the thing stops growing at a, a set square you had in your last slide? Yes, so it's that, um, it's that contour, um, it's roughly um, around F of, it has a small dependence on alpha, but it's roughly around of F, uh, F of 10 to the 10 to the 15 Jev. Um, and what, sorry, but what sets that? So what's setting that contour again? Yes, so the, the definition of the contour is um, when, when this process becomes fast enough that it can compete with that process, with the super radiance. Oh, I see. So oh, now, now I see a point. I right. see. So you want the two rates to become comparable before order one, you know, before order one of this, this spin depletion has occurred. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and that corresponds to... Uh, the, 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 this growth, this, this growth being simultaneous, essentially, effectively simultaneous. Um, Can I oh, ask one more question? Sure, sure. Uh, when I understood correctly, you considered quartic self interactions. Do you know if this qualitative picture holds if you, if you also take into account uh, different kind of interactions? So, um, well, we worked, we, we tried cubic self interactions and because cubics, you can't have non-relativistic processes are very are, are 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 the most important. And cubics, because you know, cubics you can only have two to ones, for example, um, um, or self-energy corrections. Um, they're they're very suppressed, and so cubic self-interactions are not gonna uh, matter. Uh, now, what about higher, larger self-interactions? Uh, you can look at the value of theta. Um, in the cloud, which we plotted, and theta actually uh, doesn't grow past order uh, about about 0.5, and so we do expect uh, larger, uh, you know, multiplicities to, to be suppressed. Um, uh, if you had in mind interactions with the standard model, I'll talk a little bit about that in the direct detection section, but. Um, Essentially, we don't we don't expect uh, things like the so the okay so there are two things. A is the individual something like uh, the individual particle physics processes are very slow and they need to be Bose enhanced in order to make any significant contribution. So something like the decay to photons, um, uh, the perturbative decay of axion to photons is extremely is extremely small compared to to those time scales. Uh, now that process itself can be Bose enhanced, uh, and 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 people have done worked on that, and, and and we did we did this analysis in the context of the cloud, and unless you have uh, very very large couplings, you don't expect those processes to to affect the evolution. Or well, not necessarily to the standard model. You could have many potential interactions in in some dark sector or something like that. 
Uh, do you have an example? Just, uh, just replace the photon with the dark photon. Oh, I see. Um, which might, might couple to, yeah. to many other. That's true, you don't have the, the epsilon. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point, uh, something to investigate in the end. So what I'd say there is you'd still, ex if you have the actual symmetry breaking scale F, you still expect that to generically set the scale of its couplings to stuff. So um, it's not that you would expect couplings to a hidden sector to be like parametrically much larger if it's also like degrees of freedom. Yeah, thank you. Following up on this, I mean, I, I uh, Olivia, your comment that, you know, okay, theta is 0.5 or something, and this actually takes into account all the Bose enhancement factors. So you do expect that this will be perturbed. That sounds fine except that you have regions on this plot where it's like 0.6, right? So that was, so, that was N over N critical. I understand, but I'm saying like, how do I know that in some of those regions where, uh, you know, even a change. So, so for example, what is theta in those regions, right? Like, you, you, do, do you know that in those regions, something that has roughly half the magnitude of the current term that you've included doesn't turn you over into a region. Uh, so I have some some plots of theta as backup slides. Maybe we can go uh, through that if you're still interested uh, uh, a, little, okay. a little later. Um, I, because I, I, I want to make sure cover signatures. So yeah, that, that's fair too. But that, we do my, have theta. My concrete question, which we can follow up then is, it, it's, it's clear that this may be perturbative Mm -hmm. But is it clear that those perturbative effects don't actually matter, given that you seem to be quite close to turnovers uh, at, at some points in parameter space? Anyway, yeah, we, we uh, yeah. continue and discuss that. No, yeah. Uh, so now we'll move on to signatures at large self-interactions. First order of business is, well, um, yeah, so um, generically, because fast spinning black hole, because um, uh, if a light axion exists, it spins down black holes. That means that fast spinning black holes can be used to place bounds on parameter space of uh, light scalar. Uh, for example, if you again go back to your mass versus spin plot for a certain axion mass, you can plot out the regions where you expect self uh, you expect super radiance to be um, to be effective, and that means that if you go out in the universe and, and measure a fast spinning black hole that is old enough and it falls into one of those regions then it basically, um, it rules out that axion mass. And as, as you take the axion mass to be larger, the curves move in this direction. So you can start from light axion mass to heavy axion to heavier masses um, and basically scan, you know, you, you scan the range and every time one of those curves crosses a black hole, that black hole disqualifies, uh, excludes that mass. But now because uh, large self-interactions prevent spin down, uh, the bounds are relaxed at large couplings. And so one thing we did is essentially go to um, go. And so this contour, um, which is the contour of quote unquote, no spin down, uh, depends on, the, depends on the, the, the age of the black hole. Uh, here we took the age of the universe. So it's in a sense, the highest it can be. In general, it goes down a little bit, and so we did, you know, due diligence and did it for uh, the black holes, the astrophysical black holes that had been used uh, to place uh, bounds on, on on axion masses before, and for each of them identified where these contours fall, and basically, if you go above this, you should you should stop excluding. Uh, the way to read this plot, so the, the all the grayed out regions um, can be safely excluded which uh, Cygnus, X, Cygnus X1 is doing most of the heavy lifting here. So basically the dark blue contour, everything that is within that can safely be excluded with super radiance. Uh, yeah, with super radiance. Um, so the bounds on the QCD axion, for example, are uh, unaffected. Um, out, dark, out dark matter band uh, corresponds to, uh, so this is the F to uh, mass relation that you would need if you wanted your axion to be dark matter, the dark region is for misalignment of order one. Um, uh, the lighter bands are for more uh, fine-tuned uh, misalignments, either close to the bottom of the potential or close to the top of the potential. So you can see that those bounds are, you know, they start to be affected, but still uh, largely unaffected. 
Um, so yeah, so the large shelf interactions kill your, your spin down bound. So you're out of luck there, but you get a nice new uh, phenomenon. Uh, namely, you can go and try to detect those non-relativistic scalar emissions. Um, so for large self interaction, detecting coherent monochromatic axion waves becomes possible. And the signature is uh, somewhat unlike, uh, the, unlike most astrophysical signals, uh, which uh, because it's highly coherent. And that's also true, for example, of the gravitational waves that were, uh, that are emitted by unusual super radiance. Um, they have, they're, they're very coherent signals. And the reason is because the, the cloud as a whole is one you can think of as one macroscopic gigantic wave function. And so uh, there's a fixed phase relations between the radiation and its source and the entire cloud acts as a coherent emitter. Uh, so you can roughly think of the cloud as, as an axion laser um, out there, potentially uh, shooting uh, axions at us. Um, the benefit is also that this segment can be extremely long lasting. Uh, as I said, if you go to large self interactions, the period of spin down is really prolonged and you get this very long period of, of, of scalar emissions uh, from thousands to billions of years, uh, which is quite good if you're doing a blind search, uh, because that means you don't have to be, you don't have to be uh, very lucky and be, you know, be looking at the right time so that a, a black hole was born recently and, 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 it, and, and it's shooting axions at you. If the signal is long enough, you're pretty much always guaranteed that um, at least one black hole, um, say in the Milky Way, will be, will be uh, undergoing this process. Now you may say, well, that's fine, but uh, so the signal is long last, okay, so the signal is long lasting, but um, what, about, what about the size of that signal? Because um, uh, the, the cloud is getting smaller. So, um, yes, yeah, so those are some plots of some signal times. Um, but what about the size of the cloud? So the, si the row at Earth is for um, uh, a black hole that's about a, a kiloparsec away and an F of around the gut scale, uh, you get something that's about what, three, three orders of magnitude below the local density of dark matter. Um, Yes, and it, and it does go down indeed at, at smaller f. So it scales with the cloud. Uh, and so you may say, well, that means my signal is going away. But the point is that as you take f to be smaller, you also expect standard model interactions to get larger. Uh, in other words, standard model interactions are sensitive to the theta parameter, which is not rho, but rather root rho over f. And that does not scale uh, with f. And so um, for representative parameters, you can get thetas of 10 to the minus 19, which is uh, small, but something that um, uh, proposed uh, axion dark matter experiments are sensitive to. And so uh, the signal does not decouple even as the cloud gets smaller and you can, you can look for it. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. So you, you made a comparison with the gravitational wave emission from mm -hmm. the clouds, uh, which, I guess I should think of it as coming from a cubic interaction between graviton and mm -hmm. uh, axions, two axions. Uh, but then earlier you said that the cubic interactions were not very important for- Yes, I'm sorry. Your Maybe calculation. Can't I get similar emission from a cubic interaction? So you could, you could so the, the point I was trying to make here is just, um, Sometimes it's just that the emission is coherent. Both the gravitational wave emission and uh, and the scalar wave emissions, basically any emission coming from the super radiant cloud system, you can think of as a, a big coherent emitter. And so it's not like the only analogy I was drawing is that both are similar in that fashion, and they are unlike most astrophysical sources where you know um, uh, you have an accretion disk where each part of the each each process sort of does its own thing, and then you get you get a broad signal that's not very co coherent. Yeah, I guess I understand your analogy, but I guess I wanted to ask a, a further question that if, okay, if I'm in a regime in which the gravitational wave emission is significant, then why why shouldn't I expect that the the scalar emission from a cubic interaction would also be significant? Right. Uh, so, so from a cubic, essentially, 
essentially if the gravity it's it is either the gravitational waves or the scalar quartic emissions that drive the evolution whatever you do the cubic you can compute what you would get from a cubic relativistic emission and that is always far subdominant so um so the cubic the cubic emission is just is always subdominant and so not, it's not very interesting for for direct detection um it, it, it basically never matters very much uh, does that uh yeah thank you yeah um, can I ask you something? This is trivial. So I'm a bit confused about the number density, the, the density of energy that you get here, because you're saying that within what are okay. So within a kilo parsec of the center of the galaxy, there is around like 10 to the 8 solar masses in dark matter, and uh, and roughly like 10 to the 10 solar masses in baryons. But out of that. Uh, how much is stars? So, so what I'm trying to think is that this is just assume that all the energy of the black hole goes into axions, and you are saying that if you distribute it in the inner kiloparsec of the galaxy, you get only three or so many less than dark matter oh, density. Sorry. So that, that would be within a kilo. That, so that would be for a specific black hole sitting at a kiloparsec away from Earth. So I'm not I'm not making any assumption at this point about the the distribution of black holes or. Uh, um, yeah. I, I'm just a bit surprised that it's so much energy density, but okay, maybe just the numbers work out, but I will have assumed that it's so much smaller than dark matter. Uh, yeah, well, as I said, you know, the, the signal really gets interesting at small f, and so in a sense, uh, mm. you know, that, that number is, is better, we made it, you know, it's better looking than, than, than perhaps it, it, it should be. Uh, really, you can, if, if you go to small f, then you could rapidly go down a few orders of magnitude. Uh, but even if you put the total energy of the black hole, just that one solar mass of the black hole, you distribute it all in scalars, and you're you're saying that that gives you well, I mean, yeah, I okay, I trust your numbers. It's just that it sounds a bit surprising. Oh, 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 oh sorry. So, so, so the the okay. So you're you're mostly converting angular momentum into into axion radiation. The change in the actual change in mass of the black hole is it's very smaller. smaller, right? It's even smaller. So that makes the the axion. Yeah. energy density and smaller yeah i mean I, daniel all i'd say is that yes this number it, this number is too is too high in the sense that this is not what you'd actually get you need to go to smaller f for you to get significant radiation so yeah you shouldn't view this number as the kind of thing you're looking to detect this is just right. some kind of this is a formula okay right. okay yeah okay sorry for that thank you um do you, oh sorry do you know about where an f it maxes out like they're saying for um right for too big an F, this isn't right because it'll be more than a solar mass or whatever. I guess I can probably estimate that quickly. But <laughs> so, so what I can what I can say is that um, at F of about so so if your goal if you're doing a blind search and your goal is mass to maximize your single time at about F of ten to the eleven Jev uh, is when you stop gaining. You know you, you you gain until about that point because after that. You know, you're not. You're just. You get a longer signal, but that doesn't really help you. Uh, I'll have some plots of expected numbers of events in a in a blind search in a few slides. Um, yes. So the uh, the kind of direct detection experiments you want to use um, is the kind of experiments that look for the so-called um, axion wind coupling, which is a coupling between the gradient of the axion field and nuclear nuclear spins. Um, it is uh, convenient to express, because it's a coupling to nuclear spin, it's, ex it's convenient to express the, the strength of the axion field in terms of, a, of an effective quote unquote magnetic field uh, that couples to the spin. So first of all, the, the coupling, as I said, as, as I said, it goes like um, one, over one over F times a small, uh, well, not a small, but a, a dimensionless number that can actually be quite large. Um, and the effective magnetic field that the axion field creates is proportional first as promised to, to theta and not to, not to rho directly. Uh, the frequency of the radiation is going to be set by the mass of the axion. So that's about a kilohertz for around a kilohertz for an ultralight scalar. Uh, and it's uh, also proportional to the axion velocity because it's a gradient coupling. And that's where you win a little bit over dark matter in that our axions from uh, superradiant clouds are still non-relativistic, 
but uh, faster than dark matter. So uh, dark matter is about V of 10 to the minus three. Uh, here, the velocities of order alpha, which can be, alpha can be of order uh, 0.1 to 0.5. And so uh, that's, that's a little bit of a gain here. But that, I, I can see how that, that would help your signal, but that also hurts the quality factor a little bit, right? Uh, well, as I said, this, the radiation is very narrow, very coherent. So, so what, that's the, the width or the, the quality factor of your signal. Right. So, so it could be like the velocity squared, right? Uh, no, because that's not a stochastic signal, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what sets the width, so you will get a little bit of a width. Well, you'll get drifts, for example, Doppler shifts from the velocity of the relative velocity of the source. Uh, you also get drifts that come from, so even if the signal is very long lived, there is a slow depletion of angular momentum. And so the background geometry is changing. So uh, alpha is changing very slowly. Um, um, and so the cloud is slowly decreasing. So you do get some changes at the level of the cloud that are gonna give you spread, but those are, are very, very narrow uh, compared to what you get for, for a dark matter signal. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so, and the kind of experiments that go and look for such, uh, us, uh, such axion wind uh, magnetic fields are experiments like CASPER, which you use, uh, you go look for them using, uh, by looking for uh, changing magnetization from this precession of polarized nuclear spins. Um, the sensitivity of which is determined by the, among other things, the volume sample V. And so here we have some projection uh, detectability prospects uh, for various values of, of the sample volume and the dimensionless coupling uh, for uh, a few nearby black holes, three nearby black holes, and then uh, two more that we, we, we made up. And you see that if you're, if you're uh, on, on the optimistic side, uh, you, you can hope to go and, and look for axion waves from actual uh, nearby black holes you'd be looking for a signal that is nearly constant in time, independent of interaction strength. Um, yes. Um, so that's looking at specific black holes. If instead you do a blind search, uh, like Peter was mentioning, the number of expected signals goes, goes up as F gets smaller because the signal duration is longer. So if you fix, uh, uh, so this is if you fix a dimensionless coupling and you change F indeed, you get more, more and more signals as, as F gets smaller. Uh, you can go up to about a hundred signals um, uh, for, for, uh, for a search with a CN of a hundred. And if instead you make a similar plot, but now you wanna do it in terms of the actual coupling, which is unconstrained until 10 to the minus nine uh, inverse Jev, uh, you can get, um, if so if F is, uh, 10 to 12, and so that would mean a C of 1,000 for this largest coupling, uh, you can get uh, quite a large number of signals uh, in a blind search. So a blind search could lead, yield a large number of signals for a lot of open parameter space. All right, so that's uh, all I wanted to say in my main talk today. Uh, in summary, self-interactions lead to uh, simultaneous occupation or of two or more levels in a quasi-equilibrium configuration in the superagent cloud. Uh, the Bosnova phenomenon likely does not occur, and uh, large, large self-interactions suppress gravitational signatures like black hole spin down and gravitational waves, but introduce uh, the new exciting signature of axion waves. And so to complete the plot I was showing you earlier, uh, now we know that as you take F to be smaller, you, so you, you, you change the signature, but the phenomenon of superradiance extends uh, pretty much over all the open parameter space. So uh, thank you. Happy to take questions. I have some backup slides. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember you guys at some point were worried about occupying, you know, higher energy levels. Mm -hmm. so, so how that was that resolved? Right, so that's well. It it it, it was resolved by um, saying that we will we would constrain ourselves to looking at when where that doesn't happen. Um, so that's the 
that's that part of parameter space I was I was uh, I was talking about that at alpha of bigger than 0.2, um, you know, which is still a small part of parameter space because you can get signals all the way up to alpha alpha of 0.01 for astrophysical black hole. So still in most of parameter space, uh, the two level system is sufficient. But here, um, yes, you will you will get. Uh, you will get generically more levels to be populated, and that's where uh, numerical work would be interesting, for example. But can I ask a little bit more about the, the high order self interactions? So, mm -hmm. so you said it, it it might be perturbative, but um, so say you take uh, take a cosine potential, right, where mm -hmm. you know the hierarchy between the different interactions, and then what I can do, for example, to sort of take the five six interaction, I can there's no blocking of the relativistic emission anymore, right? Because four to two is fine. Four to two is, well, it's gonna, every time you get, four to two is still gonna give you, like if the product is relativistic, you're still gonna get, suffer this large alpha suppression, right? So it's not, it's not about the, the oh, so you're, I see. Um, it's more than, yes, four to two is fine. Yes, okay. Right, so, so right. So what I'm wondering is just if, if you would include the five, six, would this have a effect or not? Uh, well, we can look. So I said, I promised the slide of the, of the data. So I can, I, can, I can go and look at the, when you put a lot of animations, it's hard to go and check. So it is true that the theta does get quite large uh, to go back to Jed's question. Um, I believe the four to two would still be highly suppressed in alpha. And so I don't think you will have large uh, relativistic emissions. Um, On this slide, so, so, you know, as, as Sebastian is commenting, if I have something like a cosine potential, mm -hmm. then I know the hierarchy between phi to the sixth and phi to the fourth. It's, you know, I can come up with different potentials that have a slightly different hierarchy. And then even if they're perturbative, like even if it's overall perturbative, like the phi to the eighth interaction ends up being smaller than phi to the sixth or something like that, it's not that hard for me to believe that in the region where theta is 0.5, the phi to the sixth interaction could be roughly as important as the phi to the fourth. And given that that 0.5 region is exactly in the region where you're like close to this Bosnova turnover, it may be a very narrow region in parameter space, but the Bosnova is a very violent and perhaps interesting phenomenon. So like, would you say there is still a possibility of this or can you conclusively say like, I don't know. Do you have some understanding about the classes of potentials, for example, where you can yeah, be sure that a bosonova that doesn't happen? Those what monodromy type potential, for example, that are not uh, Taylor expandable? No, no, no. It's like still a Taylor expandable potential. No, nothing yeah. super weird. Just like if the phi to the sixth term, you know, there's a coefficient. It's not just, it's not just, you know, phi to the sixth, right? There's a coefficient that sits out in front of that. And even if the overall scale of that coefficient is set by the uh, F you know, your, your, your symmetry breaking scale F, there's also maybe an order one number there and 0.5 squared is not that small, right? So mm -hmm. if that order one number is four, then th this matters just as much as your true. Uh, five to the fourth interaction. The, the five, six, uh, yeah, the self energy for this, from the six point function. Um, at least, I, Personally, I'm satisfied with saying that that theta is about 0.1 and about 0.2 at alpha of 0.2. And above that, as I said, you, you, you tend to dilute the cloud further. So I wouldn't be too worried about this region, um, but. Wait, why? Sorry, the, the, the point on this plot where you're in the 0.5, isn't that exactly the same point where the n critical or sorry, n max over n critical was 0.6. So the cloud I'm isn't diluted. I'm just saying this plot should probably not be trusted above alpha of 0.2.
Oh. And those numbers are likely to go down if you do the correct thing. I see. Correct thing is hard to do, but. Uh, correct thing being this multi level, like you yeah, include extra growing multi -level. levels. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we're not talking like three levels, we're talking like. A, a hierarchy of many, many ends. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a different problem altogether. I see. Any other questions? Hello, may I, may I ask something? Uh, yeah, like I, I'm wondering like when you uh, turn up like a GN like uh, to bigger and bigger, like at which point do you start to like mess up with the disk or like the disk mess up with you? Uh, yes, so at very large CNs uh, for realistic response functions of, uh, of the of, of nuclear spin response function of the disk, uh, basically CNs of maybe, I don't know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, uh, not, uh, not values of, not values of the type we've, we've, we've considered. Uh, yeah, so what, what is the first thing that happens, like when I make it bigger? You mean like physically, like what's the first type of this? Well, you could, um, are you worried about disrupting the growth of the cloud, for example? Or like, uh, I mean, like it's, some of these objects you show has a disk, right? Yes. They are X-ray emitting, right? So, so like, uh, do you ch change the accretion type things? Like, would the would the would the would the cloud affect the accretion disk? Yeah. Yes, but you would you would again you would need very very large CNs. Uh, it's more likely, it's more likely that you have the other way around. I think that the the the, the disk affects the cloud because the the cloud is somewhat uh, sensitive to the symmetry, of of to the axis symmetry. So uh -huh. I think it's more likely to expect that you would get the cloud to be disrupted, um, as opposed to be able to I don't know do something like, um, see see effects of like the axion emission being changed by the disk and being able to see, you know, if, uh, effects from the, from, from the disk affecting the radiation. Um, so yeah, you could, you could disrupt the cloud uh, at absurdly large CNs, but uh, yes, we don't expect that to happen for realistic CN. That can still lead to detection on her. Okay. Thanks. Can you, you go back to your final summary plot? Am I, am I correct in my understanding that this really doesn't affect at all predictions for the QCD axiom? Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. They're, you know, uh, they're not self-interacting enough. Uh, uh, oh, okay. yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the thanks for the many questions. Uh, it's the first time giving this talk, so it's it's good to see what what people are are curious about. Yeah, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you. Yeah, very nice talk. Great job. Great job, Olivier.